and eventually a post ben indefinitely, all of the things that we're first scared of happening late in life. Someone once described it to me, I thought it was a really interesting analogy, they said we want to live our lives like an incandescent light bulb, not like a fluorescent light bulb. Incandescent light bulbs burn brightly their whole life and then suddenly go out. But of course that's not true. I mean... They flicker a little bit at the, the end? The, the, no, no, no. Well, it, well, um, what's not true is the desirability of that scenario. If you're 90 years old but you're still biologically 30, you probably don't want to die in your sleep <laughs> that's tomorrow a good point, night, yeah. Right? Yeah, so, but, but I guess the, the, the differentiator was that they don't want to uh, imagine this life of living in nursing homes and hospitals That's and right. being frail uh, near the end. Uh, l let me get to another, that, that sort of dovetails nicely to another viewer question. Biad in the United States write this, of those who have lived long lives, what is the common thread? What is the one thing I can do today that can make me live long? And again, we're, we'll, we'll add to that question a little bit and say live long but with a good sound mind and a good song, sound body. Right. Things that you have found, then I'll ask Dan as well. Right. I think the answers that Dan and I have already given uh, really sum up the, the, the basics of it. You've got to have you, you, a But you're not time. doing anything differently right now. Well, I guess I'm not doing anything stupid either. I don't smoke, for example. You, you don't know, smoke. I, I eat a you don't jump out in front of buses. Correct. Correct. I, have, <laughs> I have a pretty good balanced diet. I don't do anything special, but I don't do anything dumb either. What about, I mean, you, you have lots of ideas. You've traveled all over the world, but are, are there things that you would say, you know, are the must-dos? Yeah, well, first of all, there's no one silver bullet. It's the sum of a, a number of small things that could add up to another 10 years of life expectancy, I think, for the average person. Uh, I think, first of all, the more meat you can cut out of your diet, the less chance you have of getting cardiovascular disease or cancer. Um, I think thinking about who you hang out with is probably the biggest long-lasting thing. Uh, we know that people who are religious live 4 to 14 years longer than people who aren't. And it's not because of faith as much as we know who people show up to church or temple or mosque four times a month are the people getting those benefits. So that's one thing you can do to stack the deck in your favor. Uh, mindfully taking time, 15 minutes a day to downshift either through meditation and prayer. And really think about where you live. We know that people who live in inner cities have a lower BMI or, or are less overweight than people who live in suburbs because mm -hmm. they're nudged into physical activity. Walking around. Yeah, I think that's more effective than, than exercise. As you know, we went to an entire town, Albert Lee, Minnesota, yeah. and we got them to adopt the nine things that we suggested for 10 months, and we raised their life expectancy by three years. And it wasn't because we said, take on this diet or try this exercise program. It was about changing their environment in small ways so that they were nudged into the right behavior. And, and it's worth expanding on that a little bit. You, you went into this town. Uh, the nine things are, you know, they're not things that were born in gleaming laboratories. These are, these are simple lifestyle changes. And what was the result both in terms of life and in terms of cost? Yeah, well, we got funding so it didn't cost the city anything, but we managed to lower their uh, health care costs by about 48 percent. And the things that we were doing is we got them to connect all their sidewalks so it was easy to walk places. Uh, we got people to cluster in groups of fives and create new relationships because, like we said, you know that, that obesity, smoking, and even happiness is contagious based on who you hang out with. So we helped sort of engineer social circles a little bit. Um, we went into schools and we made, f for example, if your children go to a school where they're allowed to eat um, food in hallways, they have, they're 9% fatter than children who go to schools where you can't eat in the hallways because when they eat in the hallways they tend to eat bad food. Okay. So we got those policies changed. And then we know that people who have a strong sense of purpose live about seven years longer than people who don't. So we brought a very clever uh, purpose uh, expert named Richard Leiter in and everybody who was involved yeah. in our program got a seminar on how to find what is important to them, what their passions are, what their gifts were. Essentially what we did was promote volunteerism. Mm -hmm. And you add all those up, each one only adds two or three percent to the equation, but when you added them all up, it added up to three extra years of life expectancy. Mm -hmm. I, I want to amplify on one thing that Dan just said actually about the economic benefits, the health care costs. Because people often think, well, you know, these therapies are going to be incredibly expensive. If we want to provide them to a lot of people, that's going to bankrupt the health care system. Right. And then people are going to be living longer as well, so it will bankrupt the um, pension system as well. It's just not true. It turns out that at the moment, as so long as you live beyond about 60 years old, the last year of your life, you consume more medical costs than in the whole of the rest of your life altogether on average. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to be saving money enormously. It's going to be economically absolutely suicidal for any nation not to provide these therapies to everybody. So it's going to be universally available and an eco enormous economic benefit to the, world, to, to the world's economy just to make sure that people stay in a fit, uh, able-bodied state. Uh, Aubrey's right. Actually, centenarians cost less over the course of their lifetime 
for health care costs than somebody who dies at 50 or 60. Because somebody dying at 50 or 60 are usually dying of expensive diseases. People who are making it to 100 tend to die very quickly and relatively inexpensively. So he's right on. But if, let's say I have a, I have a family history of heart disease, uh, Aubrey, and um, you know, I have uh, other things that uh, might potentially end my life earlier uh, than some of the things that we're talking about here. Uh, again, I know some of this is hard to predict, but are we talking about um, some sort of genetic therapy? Are we talking about things that would uh, try and um, combat some of those typical cause of death? Or? So, so first thing to say is that the sorts of regenerative medicine that I'm focusing on will be, will be things that can be applied more or less the same to absolutely everybody, irrespective of whether you're high risk, low risk, whatever. Some people at high risk might have to take these therapies more frequently or more thoroughly, but it's essentially going to be the same therapy. The big difference between people who are at risk and people who are at less risk today is the sorts of things that Dan's talking about, the lifestyle changes, the improvements in terms of diet and exercise and so on, that will essentially normalize the, um, like the longevity expectation, the healthy longevity expectation of such people. Um, but beyond that, yes, these therapies will be... 20, highly, 30 years from now. Yeah. Right? These therapies that I'm more focused on, the regenerative therapies, will be highly sophisticated. Um, there'll be quite a lot of stem cell therapies involved, though generally not embryonic stem cell therapies. We're past that stage now. We don't, we're not needing to really worry about embryonic stem cells anymore. Um, you think most of the stem cell benefits can be derived from... Non-embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells, or adult otherwise. stem cells, or cells that have been de-differentiated into an embryonic-like state. So taking a skin cell, body. for example, and, and reverting it backwards, as yes, opposed this to is a new technology developed a couple of years ago that everyone's using now, and it's really going to be the the, the, the mainstay of, cell, of stem cell therapy in the future. Gene therapy is also going to be involved. Now that's something that a lot of people are scared of. It's had a rocky ride in um, in the clinical world so far. But quietly, research has been carrying on, progress has been made in the laboratory and elsewhere um, over the last 20 years, and we're getting to the point where gene therapy is going to come into its own. Tissue engineering is another mm. example of the same thing, an area that went commercial perhaps too, good, too soon for its own good um, well over a decade ago, and a lot of companies lost a lot of money, but it's now getting to the point of real viability. Major breakthroughs are happening all the time. And all of these things combined will be going to address the various aspects of aging simultaneously. The big departure from current medical practice really will be the application of a lot of different therapies at the same time to the same people who are not in a particularly unhealthy state yet. So it's more preventative and it's more multifaceted than your typical medical treatment. And that will be a scary transition for the medical profession but it will be a transition that's well worth it. In some ways, you're, I mean, it sounds like when you're describing the body this way, it almost sounds more like a machine. That's correct. The that body is a machine. The body is a really, really complicated machine, and we don't have the plans, obviously, but it's still a machine. And the approach that works for extending the healthy lifetime of the human body beyond its warranty period will be exactly the same as it is for vintage cars or for First World War airplanes or whatever. Yes. Well, take a macro view. You know, um, Chronic diseases cost America $1.1 trillion a year. Right now, we spend most of our money trying to fight heart disease or trying to fight cancer. And the fundamentals that Aubrey's talking about would essentially eliminate those, uh, most of those diseases. And we spend very little money researching the types of interventions he's talking about, the type of technologies. And um, we should be spending money on that because it would, it would at the end of the day, it would be more economic than trying to fight all the little causes. Especially if you make the argument, as Aubrey does, which is that if uh, you can let people live this longer life without a lot of the costs of chronic health care, uh, you can make a, a very strong argument. It is quite sad at the moment. This whole, the work that I'm talking about, these regenerative therapies that are some way off, relies for funding pretty much entirely on philanthropy. There's virtually no funding coming, except in very narrow areas, such as stem cell therapies, um, for, from the government or from private industry. It's all right, visionary, wealthy people, and um, you know, that's not how it should be. Are, are you, uh, are you, do you think about death? I mean, is this, is this something you... Not very much. You know, I wear a seatbelt. <laughs> you know, I make sure I don't do anything, anything dumb. But no, what drives me is simply the humanitarian aspect of this, trying to do as much as possible, as uh, quickly as possible, to save as many lives as possible. I don't really think about my own death. Dan talked about sense of purpose, which in Japanese I, I think they refer to as ikigai. Ikigai, that's right. Ikigai. Is this your sense of purpose? Absolutely, yes. I'm really driven by this. How, how did you get involved in this? 
I became a biologist more or less by accident, by marrying one and, and switching fields in the mid-90s. Um, and uh, so, you know, I just found it extraordinary that there's such, la such apathy about aging. And this apathy extends across most biologists. They just don't regard aging as their problem. They don't regard it as important or even interesting. And I was so shocked by this. It's really, it, it was the thing that made me switch fields because I realized that I could make a difference. Did she ask you to cut your beard? <laughs> On the contrary, my <laughs> wife actually asked me to grow the beard. Who's she asked you to grow the beard? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about you, Dan? I mean, do you think about that? Uh, yeah, somewhat. But I think more about life. And, and um, these nine things I talk about in Blue Zones, while they, they will extend your life expectancy, more importantly, they keep you uh, biologically younger at every decade up to that. So, uh, interesting, I'm doing a huge worldwide study on happiness right now, funded by National Geographic, and you find out that the same things that seem to um, cause or are associated with longevity are also associated with happiness. Mm. So at the end of the day, pursuing these things that will help you live to age 90, a healthy age 90, will also get you there with the highest level of well-being. And, and therein lies my key guy.